Good morning. Good morning. Uh, from the clock in the back of church, it's 10.04, it's time to go. Uh, anyway, good morning. I'm Pastor Doug DeGroat. I am pastor at the Cornerstone Prison Church, or one of the co-pastors at Cornerstone Prison Church in, uh, Su- in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, at the, the uh, South Dakota State Pen- Penitentiary. So um, you'll get to know a little bit more about the work that I do as we go throughout the service. Um, my wife and I and uh, our family still reside in Hull, Iowa. Uh, when I took the job at Cornerstone, I decided I wasn't going to move the kids while they were in high school. Besides, my son is considerably bigger than I am, and I didn't want to be dropped in a ditch somewhere and left for dead. So um, that's we still reside in Hall there, and my daughter's a senior in high school. That's my youngest. So I have uh, four boys and a, and a princess, and uh, she's the, the last one. Anyway, I uh, do have... One annu- or two announcements that I was asked to bring to your attention. Um, the decoration making for Christmas party committee meeting is tomorrow night, and then the um, Christmas party will be Monday, December 6th at 1 p.m. So um, please uh, pay attention to that. With that, um, let's please rise for the call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. May the peoples praise you, O God, and may all all peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) I apologize. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. We'll continue our worship service with hymn number 16. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name.
receive God's greeting. To God's holy people, here in Grandview Reformed and throughout the world, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. As God has greeted us, let's turn and greet one another. And with that, we'll continue our worship service with some praise songs.
We'll continue our worship service with responsive reading number 24. And thank you for to the to those who are leading us in those praise songs. You guys did a great job. Thank you very much. And I'll try to remember that I'm the leader this time. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will be glad and rejoice in you. The Lord reigns. He established his throne for judgment. Judgmental and righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Sing praise to the Lord. We sing praise to the Lord. You may be seated. Please join me as we look to God in a time of congregational prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, redeeming Savior and comforting Spirit, blessed and holy Trinity, we come to you in this morning time and we recognize, Lord, your majesty and your power. We recognize how your covenants are renewed every morning as the sun comes up on the eastern horizon as it moves its way across the sky and sets once again on the western horizon you control everything that happens from sunrise to sunrise nothing is beyond your control nothing is outside of your power your glory and majesty extend forever. Father, we stand in awe of your presence. We stand in in complete and total amazement of everything you do. But we also are aware of our human frailties, our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our sinfulness. Lord, we know that we are unable to go for a day without falling short of your ideal. We are unable to go about our day-to-day activities without in some way, shape, or form, whether in thought, word, or deed, committing a transgression against you. So Lord, we know that we cannot earn our way. We cannot do enough good works to earn our way into your kingdom, into your heaven. All we can do is plead for mercy. Ask you to bestow your grace onto us to sprinkle the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, onto each one of us, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, all sinfulness, all wrongdoing, all guilt, all shame, and creating in each one of us a clean and pure heart, a heart that longs to love you and serve you. Lord, we thank you for the harvest that is being collected and brought in. We thank you for how you have watched over all of those who are involved in in the, the raising of the crops and in bringing in of the harvest. We thank you for the harvest, Lord. We thank you for how you sent rain, how you sent sunshine, 
all the things we need for the crops to grow and for the harvest to occur. Lord, we ask that we, you watch over all of those who are involved. We know that they will be continuing to put in the long days. We ask that you keep them safe, that you protect them as they travel on the roads and as they work around the machinery, whether it's in the fields or where the harvest is dropped off, where the grain is, is brought. Keep them safe. Watch over them. And Lord, we continue to lift up this church. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with her and provide her with leadership. Sustain them. Help them to always be a light on a hill. A beacon which shines in the dark night where everyone will know that at this church, in this congregation, you are Lord of all. We pray, Lord, for those who are in hospitals or care facilities or confined to their homes. We ask, Lord, that you watch over them, that you grant them your peace and the, your healing mercies, your comfort. We pray also, Lord, for all of those who are undergoing medical treatments, who are in the midst of dealing with different illnesses and diseases and injuries. We ask for your healing mercies to be poured out onto them as well. And Lord, we pray for our children. We ask, Lord, that they continue to grow and thrive in homes and in churches and in schools and communities where you are Lord, where your name is praised. We ask, Lord, that they be raised up and, and taught in such a way that when they come of the reasoning age that you will, they will proclaim that they want you as their Lord and Savior that they love you first and foremost. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We ask, Lord, that they, watch, they be watched over, that the decisions they make will not be ones that are made so that they receive the benefits, but the decisions will be made so that all people will benefit. We pray also, Lord, for our military, for those men and women who volunteered and gave up their time and their talents, some the most precious sacrifice gave of their lives so that we could gather here together and worship you and to praise your name without fear of repercussion imprisonment. We ask, Lord, that you be with them and keep them safe. Be with their families. Provide them with comfort and peace as they deal with the separation. And Lord, we lift up our missionaries. Those men and women who you have called to serve in different capacities and in different countries whether it's in a land far away with a different language and a different culture, or whether it's nearby, working with those less fortunate, working with the incarcerated, working with those who suffer from addictions. Wherever it may be, Lord, will help us to, each and every one of us, recognize that our true mission field, what we are called to do, what you called each one of your followers to do, is 
to share the gospel. Help us and equip us, Lord. We pray this all in your most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes to us from the book of Revelation. And at Cornerstone, we are currently going through a series of the seven churches in Revelation. We will be looking at Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, the, Rev the church in Philadelphia. Hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming, going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write my, on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. How many of you, and this is especially for those that are younger than me, um, how many of you have heard of the book or seen the book, Where's Waldo? Where you have to look for this car cartoon character-like guy, and he's in the midst of all these people or something, he's hiding in plain sight. Waldo hides himself in the crowded scenes on each page, inviting children to find where he's hiding. Now, parents around the world love the moments when their children, and I know we've had it with our kids, when they found Waldo, they got so excited. They also enjoy occasions when, parents also enjoy it when our children say, or our grandchildren, as I have now, Grandpa, will you help me find Waldo? I can't find him. Now, the city of Philadelphia, the name literally, literally means brotherly love. And this is the youngest of the seven churches in Asia Minor. And it was originally founded as a outpost, missionary outpost for Hellenism, the spread of the Greek language and the Greek culture. Philadelphia had been built with the deliberate intention that it might become a missionary city. Beyond Philadelphia lay the wilds of Phrygia, the barbarous tribes. And it was established and intended that the function of Philadelphia would be to spread the Greek language, the Greek way of life, the Greek civilization through the regions beyond the wild territory. Now, Philadelphia is a young city, some 28 miles southeast east of Sardis. It had been found by Attalus II, also known as Philadelphus, 
about 150 years before Christ. Like its neighbor Sardis, it suffered destruction during the earthquake in A.D. 17, but was not rebuilt on the grand scale that Sardis was. At the same time, the city was renamed to honor Tiberius, the emperor, being given the name Neo Caesarea. But then during the reign of Nero, from 54 to 68 AD, the original name of Philadelphia was restored upon it. However, during the reign of Vespian in AD 70 to 79, the city was once again renamed. This time it was given the name Flavia. Now on a side note, the reason that's important, because historians are more able to date the book of Revelation by using the name changes of the city. Because the Lord gave the message to the, city, to the church in the city of Philadelphia, it would be logical for us to assume that the letter was written by John during the time of Emperor Nero, from 54 to 68 AD. Understanding that if it had been written later, it would have been given to the church in Flavia. Now, Philadelphia was a prosperous city. It was, one of the, it was located on one of the greatest highways of trade in the world at that time, highway which led from Europe to Asia, from the west to the east, a gateway from one continent to another. The city was also known for its beautiful buildings. At one time it was called Little Athens, but also known for her earthquakes, which required frequent evacuations. It was said that to walk through its temple scattered streets was to be reminded of Athens, the center of worship from the Olympian gods. Now, as we've been studying these different churches in the books of Re first and, or second and third books of Revelation, we've noticed that there's five C's that are common to each one of these churches. And the first is the character, how Christ describes himself. And Christ describes himself in this one as who ho he who holds the key of David, referencing the prophet Isaiah 20, in Isaiah 22, 22, where we read, I place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Christ also describes himself as holy and true. No one can ever argue that his admission of some and his refusal of others is unrighteous or unfair. Secondly, Christ gives a compliment to the churches. And the church in Philadelphia gets high praise from the Lord. I know you have little strength to oppose evil. You have kept my word and not denied my name. You've been faithful. You've kept my command to endure patiently. Now, one thing that's different about Philadelphia, there's no criticism. All the other churches had something that they were doing wrong. Philadelphia did not. Then Christ gives a command. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Keep the faith. And lastly, a commitment. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. The use of a pillar is important because after these earthquakes, the buildings would fall down and collapse, and the only thing that would be left was the supporting pillars. And then the use of the name of my God and the city of my God and a new name inscribed on the pillar just makes obvious sense. When things happen, when destruction comes, the pillar's the only thing that's left. Now, Philadelphia was a city in the midst of contrast. As I mentioned before, originally this city was a missionary city with the sole purpose of spreading the Greek culture and language through the whole region. It was a gateway to two continents, Europe on one end and Asia on the other. Yet the text tells us that the Jews had closed the doors of their synagogue to anyone who wasn't Jewish by birth. 
they, like their counterparts in Smyrna, believed that their salvation was totally based on biology, the composition of their DNA, rather than faith in God. They had been deceived by Satan and were continuing in that deception, locking the doors to anyone who was actually actively seeking God. Although the text does not directly say so, it is quite likely that these synagogues had closed their doors to and perhaps even excommunicated any Jewish converts to Christianity. In this, Jesus did not speak against all Jewish people. It would be entirely wrong to speak of all the Jewish people as being a part of the synagogue of, of those who say they are Jews and are not. Jesus spoke specifically of a group of Jewish people in Philadelphia who persecuted the Christians during this period, who make life absolutely miserable for him. Still, Christ pledges three very specific things to this church. First of all, Christ informs them that he had placed before them an open door that no one can shut. Secondly, their tormentors and prosecutors, or persecutors, the Jews who belonged to the synagogue of Satan, would one day fall down at their feet. And thirdly, Christ promised to keep the Philadelphian believers from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. Now it's easy for us to comprehend having our tormentors and our, our persecutors fall down at our feet. It makes logical sense to us. We remember that Bible verse where it says, at the name of Jesus Christ, all knees will bow. I'm paraphrasing. And the third portion is also logical and easy to understand, that Christ would save the believers in Philadelphia from the persecutions which are to come. But the first door, the first portion, the open door, that tends to give us a little bit more confusion. What, what is Christ saying with that? What does Christ mean or imply by informing the believers that there's an open door right before you? Does it mean an open door to heaven? Does it reiterate that the door to heaven is open to those who remain faithful? Those who remain true to the faith? Or does it suggest that Christ has opened a door for spreading the good news? What does an open door mean to us? What does that imply? If someone tells us that, hey, there's an open door right in front of you, what does that suggest to you? If someone suggests evangelism, sharing the gospel with someone, what images conjure up in your thinking? I think that most of us, if you get a little scared or a little frightened, Maybe intimidated when there's talk about evangelizing, sharing the gospel, sharing your faith. It's a whole lot easier to point the fingers at the minister and say, yeah, that's what you're paid to do. That's what a missionary is called to do. Now, I can understand the fears and apprehensions. I had them myself. still have some. But if we believe in the words of Christ as spoken just before he ascended into heaven, known as the Great Commission, each one of us is instructed to share the gospel and to spread the gospel. Now there's a story about this dialogue that occurred between the theologian Charles Spurgeon and a man who sought out his wisdom and counsel. And the dialogue goes like this. A man once came to Spurgeon and asked how he could win others to Jesus. And Spurgeon asked him, well, what do you do? What's your occupation? Well, the man said, I'm, I'm an engineer. I drive, a, I drive a train. 
And then Spurgeon said, this is in the days of the, the coal-fired trains. He said, so who is the man who shovels the coal on your train? Is he a Christian? The engineer replied, I don't know. And Spurgeon told him, go back and find out. Start with him. The church in Philadelphia was given, was responsible to complete four tasks that Christ gave them in this letter. The first task was they were to remain loyal disciples of their Lord. Second, they were, affir they were to affirm their loyalty to Christ to the people around them. Thirdly, they were to live in the realm of love. And lastly, fourth, they were to welcome people into the fold, some of who may surprise them, but those who respond to the witness, who respond to the sharing of the gospel. The church in Philadelphia was given a task to complete for the Lord. Share the gospel. Now, there is some clues in the text as to how they were supposed to accomplish this. Christ placed an open door right before them. In other words, there's a missionary opportunity right in front of you. Embrace it. Go for it. The Christians in Philadelphia found the doors closed to them in the Jewish synagogue. But Christ had opened another door for them. They were not a great and powerful congregation, but God was going to open doors for them that had been closed and locked by Satan. Christ holds the key to every door. Now, if God decides that a door should be opened, Christ has that key. If it's decided that that door should be shut and locked, Christ has that key as well. In other words, God already knows whose heart is ready to hear and receive the gospel message. Whose heart is, and those whose heart is not ready right now, but may be ready later. The first century doctrinal portrayal of the missionary task of the Christian church is just as relevant and strategic today as it was back then. The task given to the church is neither too easy, I know you have little strength, Revelation 3.8, nor is it too difficult. We as Christians are not asked to open heavy doors or to break down locked wall doors, but to walk through the doors that Christ has already opened. The job at hand, the task would be way too hard for us to open a closed door or break down a locked one unless the Lord empowers each one of us for the particular mission that he has chosen for us. On the other hand, the Christians in Philadelphia and for most of us here today were given a down-to-earth strategy. Four sensible parts and workable parts. First, this is for all of us, begins at the beginning. There is nothing to share if you don't have anything. If you do not have faith in Jesus Christ, if you do not believe Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, the Redeemer, our way to spend eternal life, we have nothing to share. We have to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in order to be able to share the gospel. You need 
to have a living and real relationship with Christ. Second, the strategy calls upon Christians to find a way to proclaim the gospel source of their identity. The direct implication of the open door imagery. The Christian faith has always been an evangelical faith which seeks to share the name of Jesus Christ and also to share the words of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the Greek term for word was logos, which would imply, logos implies the meaning of it all. In the Old Testament world, the Hebrews were, used a term, debar. And the use of the name of God, both with the authority and with the one who creates the word, in both instances, the preaching task of the church is to share the meaning and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, believers are instructed to live in the love of Christ. Because that is what is in them. That's what that is at work in them. And between them. And working towards their neighbors. This is what will be the identifying mark of the true Christian. Their love will be like the fragrance of a flower garden in full bloom. You cannot walk by it without catching that sweet aroma of the flower. The same is true for Christians. People should not be able to walk by us without noticing something different. The, their love, the Christian's love, will be the curiosity which initiates that desire to seek the source behind the love that they have. And lastly, Christians are instructed to welcome the people who will come to the people of God as a, re, as a combined result of divine and, and evangelical strategy. It's ultimately God who invites people into his church. And very often, those who are invited are an unexpected surprise for both the church and the person invited. Now, a few months ago, I met a person, a man in, in uh, prison by the name of John. John grew up in the projects. And as he says, I grew up in the projects in Boston. Okay? Doesn't talk very Midwestern. You know, Boston. He goes, Pastor Doug, by the time I was six years old, I saw my first murder. By the time I was eight, I had witnessed three. Also, by the time I was eight, I had been abused sexually, verbally, and physically. I had alcoholic parents. Alcoholic mother and an alcoholic stepfather. Father wasn't in the picture. He said, Pastor Doug, I looked to the dark side. I longed to see violence. I longed to see the gang activity, people getting beat up in my neighborhood. Eventually, his parents moved to a suburb out of the projects. But he continued his, his life that he had started. He was addicted to drugs, violence, sex. 
you name it, he was doing it. He was the, he's a big man, and grew quickly. By the time he was 16, he was the number one drug seller, drug pusher in his suburban town. But he was also the enforcer. His suppliers would tell him who to beat up, who to get rid of. People would hire him to steal their cars, drive them to an abandoned alley or something and set them on fire so that they could collect the insurance money. And all the while, John is getting deeper and deeper into the coven of witches that he was initiated in by the time he was 13. He longed for the darkness of Satan worship. In his teen years, he would break into a, a church, remove everything from the, from the platform where the pulpit was, spray paint a pentagram on the, the carpet, and do a satanic ritual, satanic worship on that platform to desecrate the church. continued in Satan worship, became known for the ability to cast spells. One of the things he would do, he said he would, people would hire him to cast a spell on someone. So he would write that person's name on a piece of paper, and then he would take a knife of some sort, and he would carve a pentagram either into his arm or into his chest, the symbol of Satan, and let that blood drip down onto that paper and set it on fire, thus releasing a demon to attack whoever whose name was written on that paper. He spent nine months down in Louisiana learning the voodoo arts. circumstances happened, he ended up in South Dakota, continuing his work, continuing his selling drugs, being a thug, continuing his Satan work, murdered someone as a result of a drug deal went bad, six pills, he killed someone for six pills. Now he's spending his whole life in prison. He continued that worship, or that continued that lifestyle in prison. But as, I'm not going to call it luck, it's circumstances. As circumstances would have it, lifers in the penitentiary have the option of having a celly or not. Because they're never going to get out, they have no consequences if they decide they don't want to have a celly anymore. They can just get rid of them. They can't punish him with a second life sentence. So he gets put in a cell with another lifer. And they get along pretty good. But this cellmate happens to be the lead guitarist in our praise band. So there's a Bible on the top shelf, God's Holy Word on the top shelf, Satan's Bible, witchcraft manuals on the, on the second shelf. They got along. They respected each other. But the guitar player never stopped praying for him. In fact, they became such good friends on that tier that our lead guitar player and our bass guitar player and several other Christians that were in that area, when someone received some bad news or when someone um, was going through something difficult, they would gather together and the guards would allow them to, to 
to gather together because the rule is you can't have more than two offenders in the same place without um, someone trained, like a pink tag like myself or um, a guard watching it, being a part of it. God arranged that they could gather together and they could have prayer together. And they'd have prayer and John would happen to be walking by and they'd say, hey John, come on, join us. So they're praying to the God of heaven and this Satan worshiper is going, just angry. But he liked the company of these guys. So eventually, John is continuing. He's found the ability to acquire drugs inside. He's casting spells on people. Things just are getting kind of weird for them, for him in that cell. So he, he opts to have his own cell. Immediately. He said immediately, Pastor Doug, as soon as I moved into a cell by myself, I was tormented every night. I woke up and I had bruises and claw marks on my body. Came to church a few times just out of graciousness. He was one who, one of the last ones who came in, first ones out the door. He was easy to recognize because tattooed right here is the image of what he considered to be his personal demon. Tattooed on each forearm is a pentagram. Wrists are covered with, and arms are covered with swastikas and other white supremacy symbols. He's laying in his bunk at night, being tormented by demons. And one night he cries out, God, I can't do this anymore. Just, Jesus, help me. Immediately it was over. It was over. He had no idea what he had done. Just so happened that a few days later, Cornerstone Church had a fellowship night. Now, this fellowship night, we played bingo, and we gave away specialty Bibles. Bibles, study Bibles with like a leather-like cover. Guess who won the first Bible, the best Bible? The Satan worshiper. My wife told me as we... We were going home that night. She was there, and she was on a different table. She goes, Doug, why was there a Satan worshiper at your fellowship night? Yeah, I don't know. You know, Somebody invited him. He read that Bible cover to cover. He gave his life completely and wholly to Jesus Christ. Now, when I talk about welcoming into the fold, he would not look like the ideal candidate to be welcoming into the fold. But he is welcomed into the fold. Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus welcomed him. God already knew his heart. And what a testimony he has. Both in the tear and by allowing me to tell his story. People are seeing what God can do. Taking a man virtually standing with a foot and most of his body in hell. And God just picked him up and welcomed him into eternity. Amen?